If you have a Bible, again, Numbers chapter 13, and while you are finding your way there, I want to read a passage from the New Testament that really is a guide to any of these stories in the Old Testament. So 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and maybe you want to jot this down at the beginning of your Bible as just a kind of a lens to see a lot of these maybe for some of you familiar stories in the Bible. So many times we read them and they become so familiar or they have been so familiar in our life that we miss really the punch. We miss what God is trying to illuminate to us. 1 Corinthians 10, verse number 6, we read this several weeks ago. It says, Now these things took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. And this is the story particularly of the golden calf. So Moses on the mountain meeting with God comes down. The people of God, the children of Israel, have made a golden calf and are worshiping it. They are acting immorally, sexually immorally. They're worshiping this golden calf and giving the golden calf credit for what God and God alone did in Egypt. There, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11, Now these things happen, here's the repeating of it, to them as an example, but they are written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Hear this, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. The warning there is when we read these stories to not make the mistake that many of us do. To, to read some of these tragedies in the Old Testament and say, well, I'd never do that. Man, how stupid are these people? What's wrong with these people? But it's meant to be a, a convicting word from God in our own hearts. It's meant to be something that serves as, as an example to us. It's meant to, meant to be instruction and warnings to you and I. And so I hope that you'll take that today because the passage that we're going to read is super sad. It's super sad, and frankly, it's very confusing to me. I've been reading it almost every day this week, just kind of pondering it, and it just breaks my heart, the turn of events that happens here in Numbers chapter 13 and 14. So let's pick up there in verse number 1. The Bible says this, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. So the story here is that the people of God have concluded their business, if we want to call it such, at Mount Sinai. God's given them the Ten Commandments. He's given them all of the Mosaic Law, 600 plus laws God imparted to them there. He's given them the blueprints for the tabernacle. We looked at the tabernacle last week. He's given them the calendar for the year, so all of their holidays, the celebration. He's given them all of the specifications for the priests and what they are to wear and what they are not to do and the sacrifices and all of those things. And now they're leaving and they are really on the doorstep of something that has been promised to them for over 500 years. 500 years. If you want to see it specifically, hold your spot there and go back to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter number 12 is the call of God to the first of the Hebrews, a man here referred to as Abram, but his name later on would be changed to Abraham. And God is making a covenant with him. And, and God literally says to him in verse number seven, after giving him the covenant, then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. Abraham is one guy with a wife and no kids at this point. And God has said, I'm going to give this land to your offspring. And there's a whole lot of questions there for Abraham. Jump forward to chapter number 15. God keeps repeating the covenant to Abraham. Verse number 7, right there at the end of the passage. To give you this land to possess. Verse number 12, as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, no for certain. Right? God is saying no with confidence, no with absolute certainty. 
What's going to happen here? That your offspring will will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there and they will be afflicted for 400 years. What's being talked about here? Abraham is not going to see Egypt. Abraham's going to have a son, Isaac, the son of promise. Isaac's going to have a son, a couple sons, the son of promise, the, the covenant line to go through Jacob. Jacob's going to have a whole bunch of sons. They're going to end up in Egypt and that's what's being talked about generations prior, God said, listen, know for certain this is how it's going to work. Your offspring is going to go to a land that's not theirs. They're going to be there. They're going to be oppressed. They're going to be afflicted for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve. And afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. So God is laying out the exodus, God's laying out the return to the promised land. He says they're going to go to Egypt. Right? He doesn't name Egypt here, but he's, they're going to go to Egypt. They're going to be there for 400 years. They're going to leave, and they're going to pillage the land. They're going to, be, they're going to come out. They're going to go in, right, as, as, be there for, as slaves for 400 years, and then they're going to come out with gobs and gobs and gobs of gold and silver and precious metals and stones and all these things God's judgment is going to be upon that nation. We know that from the ten plagues that God brings upon them. Verse 15, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a, in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. What, look down to verse number 18, right there in the middle of the verse. To your offspring I give this land. Here's the boundaries of it. From the river of Egypt to the great river, the river, river Euphrates, and the, and the specifications there. Go forward to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter number 2. This, excuse me, Exodus chapter number 3. This is Moses at the burning bush. He has been in exile. Right, He was in Egypt 40 years there murdered a man, left Egypt, is now on the backside of the desert for 40 years, and then God shows up. Look at what God says in verse number 7 of chapter 3. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, right? I'm going to bring them out of this land of oppression, right? This is really salvation, the Exodus story, but not just to bring them out, but to bring them also up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, This is what God says. I'm going to do this. And he's been saying the same consistent thing for hundreds of years. Now go to Numbers chapter 13, and it's about to happen. It's about to happen. They have spent generation after generation in slavery in Egypt. They come out of Egypt with miraculous signs and wonders. They come to Mount Sinai. God meets with his people there. Moses intercedes for the people when the people fail. God gives them the tabernacle. Man, put that tent right in the middle of your camp so that you know that I am with you. When it's time to leave, the presence of God will literally ascend out of that tent. And then you'll see, okay, we got to go pack everything up. We're going to follow that cloud. It's going to be fire at night so you can see it clearly. And then when it stops, you stop, set up camp right there. They know exactly where and when and how they're supposed to move. And now they're right about to go into the promised land that Abraham was promised, that his son Isaac was promised, that Jacob was promised, that Joseph back in the book of Genesis longed to see generation after generation after generation, wished to see the promised land. And now these guys are about to see it. That's the setup of the story here in Numbers 13. Look at the text. Verse, uh, right there in the middle, verse number two. From each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, every one, a chief among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran according to the command of the Lord. All of them men who were heads of the people of Israel. Their names are listed there. And they are going to go into the land. Verse 17, Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan. So they're going to go into the promised land. And they're going to spy it out. They're going to take a bit of a survey of what's happening. 
Now, I want you to hold your spot in Numbers, and I want you to go to the book of Deuteronomy. It's the very next book. It has a very intimidating title. It just means the sermon. It's Moses' final words to the nation of Israel. It's his, his last will and testament, if you will. Deuteronomy chapter 1, and verse 19. And don't worry about spelling Deuteronomy, because, man, I mess it up every single time I go to write it. I'm like, is the E before the U, the U before the E? How many O's are in there? Verse 19, then we set out from Horeb, went through all that great and terrifying wilderness that you saw on the way to the, uh, to the hill country of the Amorites, as the Lord your God commanded us. And we came to Kadesh Barnea. And I said to you, you have come to the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. I want you to see that phrase. God said to Abraham, I'm giving you this land. God said to Jacob, I'm giving you this land. God said to Isaac, I'm giving you this land. God said to Moses, I'm giving you this land. Here he's repeating it again. I'm giving you this land. And it's not like Moses kept that a secret. Moses is saying, God is giving us this land. Verse 21, see, the Lord your God has set the land before you. Go up, take possession as the Lord, the God of your fathers has told you. Do not be afraid or be dismayed. Then all of you came near. So if you take Numbers 13, you take Deuteronomy 1, you start to understand a little more thoroughly what was happening on the doorstep of the promised land. Then all of you came near and said to me, let us send men before us that they may explore the land for us and bring us word again on the way by which we must go up and the cities into which we shall come. Verse 23, this thing seemed good to me. God, in his grace, is telling the people to go to the promised land and they're nervous. Why? Because they had never been there before. And so they're like, can we, can we send a, some spies in there first? And God's like, that's fine. We can do that. And so God commands Moses, send some spies in there. And so they pick out 12 guys that are leaders, probably younger guys, because they're going to travel 250 plus miles in about 40 days. So they're going to pick some younger leaders in, in the nation, they're going to send them into the land, and they're going to come back with a report. And that's exactly what happened. Back to Numbers 13. They want to know what the cities look like. They want to know what the land looks like. They want to know where the paths, like the roads, the travel will look like. They want to know all of those different things. Verse number 20 there. Be of good courage. Bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first grapes. So they went up and spied out the land. And so they, they go through the whole land there. Verse 28, again, just a little survey here. The descendants of Anak were there. They came to the valley, verse 28 there. And I need readers, it's getting close. That's not 28, that's 23, people. It's happening. And you get to laugh about it, just so you know. I'm going to blame it on the print. Anyways, they came to the valley of Eskol and cut down from there a branch with a single cluster of grapes, and they carried it. Look at the size of this cluster of grapes. They carried it on a pole between two of them. Right? The evidence of this land being a land that flows with milk and honey, meaning it is a prosperous land. It's a green land. Goats and cows are going to go there. They're going to eat. They're going to be sustained. They're going to give milk. So that's the land flowing with milk. And you know there's bees there. So there's bees and they're pollinating fruit trees. And you got all this different stuff there. So the land flowing with milk and honey is a very weird. I remember sitting in Sunday school as a kid going, land flowing with milk and honey. Like, that's weird to think about. Like, all I could picture in my mind was like the soft serve ice cream machine at like an ice cream place. Like, I'm like, I just don't have a visual. Well, when you realize, man, you got birds and you got bees going on there and you got fruit trees all over the place and then you got green grass everywhere that cows and goats and sheep are eating. It's like, man, that's a, you can live off that land. It, man, it sounds, keep in comparison, sounds compared to Egypt, man, it sounds like the Garden of Eden. These slaves are going to an incredible place. Moses says, go and get some grapes. I know it's about the time of grapes, so I'd like to see some of those. And the cluster of grapes was so big, they had to attach it to a pole between two guys and carry it back. So they spent about 40 days there, and they came back. Verse 25. And this, tragically, 
is where things really start to take a sad turn. At the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. They came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Like they're bringing back tangible evidence. Hear this, that what God has always said is true. It is a land that is incredible. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's a land that is amazing. We cannot wait to get there. They bring back this massive single cluster of grapes that has to be carried by two guys. And it's like, wow, here is actual evidence that what God said about this land is 100% true. Verse 27, they told him, we came to the land which you sent us. It flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Verse 28, however, however, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large Besides, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of Negeb. The Hittites, the Jebusites, the Amorites dwell in the hill country. The Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the Jordan. What has God also said? I, I just, I, I, want you to, I want you to see this because I don't want you to miss this. God said, to the place of the Canaanites. All the way back in Exodus chapter 3 to Moses, and he relays this same message to the people when he goes to Egypt to see them. He says, It's a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. So those ites are not listed there just to get you tongue tied or confuse you, right? It's meant, and again, it is historical too, right? It's historically accurate. The Hittites, again, believe for a long time they didn't actually exist. And then, of course, lo and behold, the Bible proven to be historically true. What did God say? It's a land flowing with milk and honey, and all of these armies are there. It's not a circumstance that God was unaware of in any way, shape, or form. God knew exactly who was there. He also knew that it was a land flowing with milk and honey. And God, over and over again, says, I'm still going to bring you there. I'm going to give this land to you. I'm going to do this. Now the spies come back. And they say, you know what? It is a land flowing with milk and honey. And here's the fruit. However, and they begin to name the armies that are there, the nations that are there, the fortified cities that are there, all of these things. Verse 30, Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. Then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we. So 12 spies, if you maybe grew up in Sunday school or catechism, you remember the song, uh, the 12 spies, 10 were bad and two were good, right? 10 rejected what God had said to Joshua and Caleb, believed what God had said. Verse 32, they brought to the people of Israel a bad report of the land that they had spied out, saying, the land. Look at the escalation of terror here. Look at the escalation of panic here. The land through which we have gone to spy out, it is a land that devours up its inhabitants. What? Back in verse 27, you said it's a land flowing with milk and honey, and here's its fruit. Now it's a land that's like a Venus flytrap for people or some craziness, right? It's a land that devours up its inhabitants. Oh, man, I'm going to reveal that I'm kind of a nerd here, but some of you are going to reveal that you're really nerds. It's the hole in the ground in the beginning of Return of the Jedi, okay? <laughs> now, if you know what that's called, keep it to yourself, okay? All right? It's like the, the, the exaggeration of the craziness here is a land that devours its inhabitants and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. Well, no. Go back to 
chapter 13 and verse number 27, the descendants of Anak were there. So there's a, a handful of some tall people there. Now it's the land eats people and everyone is huge. Right? Can't say the word huge anymore. Donald Trump's ruined that word, right? Verse 33, sorry. Too political, I know, but whether you vote for him or don't vote for him, he's ruined the word huge. Okay, verse 33. Gosh. Anyways. <laughs> Focus. I'll try, you try. Verse 33. There we saw the Nephilim. Now the Nephilim is this mysterious thing back in Genesis chapter 6. And I don't want to derail here. Genesis chapter 6, right prior to the flood, it seems there's this introduction of this people group called the Nephilim, and they seem to be half demon, half human. Now, it's a very, you can have a different interpretation of, you, of that if you'd like, but it, there in Genesis chapter 6, demons see people and they somehow possess men and they produce this race called the Nephilim. Uh, J.R.R. Tolkien uh, took this idea and that's where orcs come from in the Lord of the Rings. So you can picture this, this terrifying imagery. Now nah, I'm a huge nerd and you know it, okay? <laughs> Numbers. Now they're saying the land eats people up. Everyone there is huge. And the Nephilim, these half-demon crazy people, live there as well. Which is not what they said originally or saw originally. They just saw Anak. They saw a tribe, a family of very tall people. And look at what they say there at the end of verse 33, the end of the chapter. And we seem to ourselves like grasshoppers. And so we seem to them. Like we showed up. And the land, yes, it flows with milk and honey. The land is spectacular. The land is exactly what God said it would be. But we started to look around and we started to notice there were all these fortified cities. We started to notice there were all of these large nations there, these large armies there. We started to look around and man, what did they do? They started to realize like, wow, these are some pretty settled, strong nations. They get back to the people and they say, yes, it's exactly what God said. We saw these things and Caleb's like, whoa, whoa, calm down, everybody. Let's go right now. Let's go do this right now. We are able to do this and I want you to see the clarity, the clarity of the rebellion there in verse 33, or excuse me, verse 31. Then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people for they are stronger than we were not able to do this and then the people started to get nervous and they started to throw more fuel on the fire they started to say man the land it uh it eats people up and everyone there is so they're huge they're enormous people there are gi giants there right there are these half demon crazy people there we're not able to do this and you can hear the panic start to take over because look at chapter 14, verse 1. Then all the congregation raised a loud cry and the people wept that night. 500 years they've been waiting for this moment. 500 years, generation after generation. I'm sure you got people sitting around going, man, my grandma dreamed about this moment. I'm sad she's not here. My dad dreamed about this moment. I'm sad that he's not here. Man, my brother dreamed about this moment, but he died in Egypt. Man, I'm sad that he's not there. Here they're hearing the report. The spies are there. Hey, everybody, the spies are back. They got this huge cluster of grapes. It's unbelievable. And then this, this excitement turns to terror. turns to fear. And you have two very different reports. Essentially the same info, same circumstances, the guys saw the same stuff, and two very different responses. Two very different responses. Now, I want you to hold your spot there in Numbers 14, and I want you to go forward to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 3. He 
Hebrews chapter 3 and verse number 12. Take your time getting there. Don't get discouraged. Hebrews chapter number 3, verse number 12. It says, take care, brothers. Almost the same thought that we saw there in 1 Corinthians 10. These things happened for your instructions. These are an example. Don't, Don't let anybody get too cocky, think that he or she cannot fall. Take care, brothers, lest there be any, be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God, but exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end, as it is said today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. What rebellion? Verse 16, for those... uh, for For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt, left by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? To whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of what? Because of unbelief. And I want you to see the key words here. You see unbelief. You see deception by sin. You see a hardened heart. You see in verse 18, disobedience. And that's what's about to take off back in Numbers chapter 14. Go there again. The people have been sent. They've spied out the land. They've surveyed the land. They've seen and confirmed everything that God has said from the very beginning. And now they hear the report. They hear this idea that there are all giants there. And they begin to to, uh, have this fear of the land eating them up. So they begin to cry. And what does that crying, what does that fear lead to? Verse number 2. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and against Aaron. And I want you to follow this. And I want you to see this pattern. And you can, again, outline the text maybe a little bit different in your own mind. God had said something. That's where we started, right? God had said something and he had been saying the same thing generation after generation after generation and now the people hear a report and what do they do? They choose to disbelieve God. What God said is not true and it begins this domino of just destruction in their life. The dominoes begin to fall and so they don't believe God and then they find themselves what? They find themselves Viewing the end of chapter 13, we seemed to ourselves like grasshoppers. And so we seemed to them. And they begin to weep. Disbelief, unbelief, lack of faith in what God has said is true leads them to emotional despair. Leads to emotional despair Then they begin to have this this weeping all night. And then verse 2, that unbelief leads to this emotional despair, which leads to grumbling, grumbling against God's leader there, against the intercessor Moses, right? Go back in your Bible, go back in your mind. How many times has Moses stepped in the gap? God's like, I'm done with these people. I'm going to start fresh with you. And Moses is like, please, Lord, don't do that. Please, God, give them grace. And so you, you got Moses like, God, I'll take care of them. Guys, stop being idiots, right? Stop doing this. Like, Moses, you're the worst leader ever. It's it's crazy and just amazing how awesome Moses is to not go like, God, I'm done with them too. Have Have a nice day, right? I'll see you in 10 minutes, right? I mean, it's just like so amazing, the grace and mercy of the intercessor, Moses, for the people. What are they doing now? They're grumbling against Moses and against Aaron, 
But I want you to see the grumbling first. Look at the end of verse number four. They said to one another, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. They've seen 10 plagues. They've seen the parting of the Red Sea. They've seen God descend on the mountain. They've seen God give law. They've seen all this stuff. And it's like, nah. Let's ditch this. His face was shining. They were freaked out. Moses, wear a veil, man. You're freaking us out with your shining face. Like, nah. Let's pick a leader. Anybody got nominations? And you know what? Forget the promised land. Let's go back to slavery. How serious were they? Jump down to verse number 9. Uh, excuse me, verse number 10. Then all the congregation said to stone them with stones. The pandemonium, the panic, the craziness is just escalating out of control. They're weeping, their, uh, their disbelief in God has led them to this, this great fear, has led them to this emotional instability, and now this just distrust of God has led them to complaining. Now they want to eliminate the godly voice in their camp. They want to kill him. But it doesn't stop there. Go back to verse number two. The whole congregation said to them, would that we had died in the land of Egypt or would that we had died in this wilderness. They're not just going to insult God anymore. They're not just going to pick up stones to kill God's leaders. Why is the Lord, right? The gloves are off. The concealment is off about who their beef really is, who they're really mad at. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become prey. God brought us out here and our wives and our kids are going to die. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? Would it not be better? God had said, I'm going to bring you into the promised land. I'm going to do this. His word was true. He'd been repeating the same thing century after century. And when the people stopped believing in the word of God, what did it lead them to? It led them to incredible emotional instability. It led them to live a life of fear. It led them to complaining. It led them to eliminating God's voices in their life. I want you to jump forward to chapter number 30, or excuse me, chapter 14, verse 39. I'm going to piece all this story together, but I want to really let you see the disastrous effects of lacking faith and belief in what God said is true. So God's, God comes to Moses and says, I'm done. And Moses says, please don't be done. And so finally God says, listen, here's what we're going to do. Everyone that's 20 years old and older, and we, we know that's a lot of people because the numbers, again, is a census there. There at the beginning of the chapter, you see the families. So everyone 20 and older is going to die. They're going to die in the wilderness. For every day that the spies spent in the land, 40 days, they're going to walk through the wilderness for 40 years and it's going to be a funeral procession for 40 years. Everyone 20 years old and older is going to die because they rejected God and they disbelieved God and they were going to kill Moses and they were going to kill Aaron and they were going to try to go back to Egypt. And so God says, listen, the very thing you thought was going to happen, you thought your kids were going to die, they're going to be the ones that get to see it and you don't. So what do the people do? They still refuse to believe God. Verse 39, when Moses told these words to all the people, the people mourned greatly. They rose early in the morning and went up to the heights of the hill country saying, here we are. We will go into the place that the Lord has promised for we have sinned. Moses said, why now are you transgressing the command of the Lord when that will not succeed? Do not go up for the Lord is not among you lest you be struck down before your enemies. For there the Amalekites, the Canaanites are facing you. You shall fall by the sword because you have turned back from following the Lord. The Lord will not be with you. Deuteronomy chapter one, one phrase out of there is just so telling. 
They murmured. They complained against God. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 41. And every one of you fastened on his weapons of war and thought it easy to go up into the hill country. They thought it was going to be easy. Back to Numbers chapter 14. They get their swords. Moses is like, you, you can't go do this. Why are you going to do this? The Lord is not with you. But they presumed. Man, you might want to underline, circle, highlight that word. Presumed. They presumed to go up into the heights of the hill country, although neither the ark of the covenant of the Lord nor Moses departed out of the camp. Then the Amalekites, the Canaanites who lived in that hill country, came down, defeated them, pursued, uh, pursued them. They were destroyed. Deuteronomy 144 says, Then the Amorites who lived in that hill country came out against you and chased you as bees do and beat you down. They go, God has said something, and the people refused to believe it. So what did it lead to? It, it led to chapter 14, verse 1. It led to incredible emotional instability that was prompted by fear and panic. And they started to just completely, again, distrust God. Then it led them to complaining against God's guy. They eliminated. They sought to eliminate godly voices in their life. They began to complain against God. They wanted to go back to Egypt. And then you see it there evidenced in verse 39 down to the end of the chapter there in verse 45. It led to self-reliance. What's 1 Corinthians 10 tell us? These things serve as an example and instructions to us. And I want you to hear this. Whenever you and I distrust the truth of what God has said, all of those dominoes fall in our life. All of the same dominoes fall. God has said truth. That's why we believe the scripture is Inerrant, meaning what it has said is true, is true for all time. It's inspired, it's God-breathed, and it is the final authority for believers, for followers of Jesus. This is our final authority. Not a pastor, not a denomination, not some covenant that the church invented. The Word of God is the final authority. But when we begin to chip away at what God has said, or when we begin to have distrust in our life, or when we begin to have a lack of faith in what God has said is reliable, then the dominoes fall, and so many believers, so many of God's people live in incredible emotional turmoil. We live murmuring lives. We complain against God's leaders. We complain against God himself. God, why did you put me in this spot? God, why is this happening in my life? And we murmur against God. And then what do we do? I see it happen all the time. We eliminate godly voices from our life. I don't want to hear from that person because she tells me the truth. I don't want to hear from that person. They tell me the truth. I don't want to hear those things. And we begin to eliminate those things in our life. And we live a life of complaining. And then this is the crazy thing. We go back to Egypt. We go back to slavery to sin. We go back to the familiar. And all that really was was another golden calf. Something else to satisfy. Something else to fill. Something else to comfort me. And the one that God is really pointing out in my life as we go back to self-reliance. When God's not going with us, psh, I'll do it. And we presume. We presume. And then the destruction happens. It's those words we pointed out just a minute ago in Hebrews. A hard heart. Oftentimes God calls the people there stiff-necked. Can I give you a word that we would use for stiff-necked? We don't really say that phrase much anymore. We would say things like unteachable. Maybe something that I, I've had to learn 
maybe will help you out if you want to know if you're unteachable or not. Ask your kids. Your spouse might feel obligated to lie to you, which means you are unteachable. There was a heart that was hardened by the deception of sin, the deceitfulness of sin. There was disobedience. And there was unbelief. And all of those things started to run rampant. The the emotional upheaval the removal of godly voices, the complaining, the self-reliance, the return to Egypt, the return to idolatry, all of that stuff started to just go like crazy in the camp. And man, do I see that happen in my life. I see it happen in your life. And it is rooted in a lack of believing who God is and what he has said is true and reliable. Hold your spot there in Numbers 14 and I want you to go to the book of Matthew real quick. This may be a passage that you remember. Maybe heard the story, Matthew chapter 14. First book of the New Testament. So it's a story of Jesus coming to the disciples, and he there on a boat in the Sea of Galilee or Lake Gennesaret, as it's called, so multiple names of the same body of water. And Jesus comes walking on the water to them. It's this, this incredible, incredible thing. Verse 28, Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat. And I, I just want to pause there. He had never done that before. And this is a guy who has spent his life on the water So he got out of the water and he, he got out of the boat and he walked on the water and he came to Jesus. He's, he's walking towards Jesus. He's walking with Jesus on the water. This is a mind blowing story. But when? Maybe in verse 30, and I don't want to change the words of God. It certainly wouldn't go on that limb. That's crazy land. But maybe just in your mind, you could put the word however. It's a land flowing with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. However, here I am on the water walking with Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus, so merciful, so kind, so gracious. Jesus immediately reached out his hand, took hold of him, saying to you, saying to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? He's experiencing the miraculous power of God And he glances over and he sees the water. In the same way, Numbers chapter 13 into 14, they saw the giants. They saw the circumstances. They saw, in many ways we could say, the negative. And they began to be overwhelmed by fear. Fear of the unknown, 
fear of the future. And what did they do? They took their eyes off of God. I want to read one passage of Scripture to you, and then I want to close, try to challenge you a little bit. Exodus 34. I have in my own study, in my own life, read this verse so many times in the last couple weeks. So moving. For those of you who weren't here that Sunday, it's okay. You can go back online if you'd like and listen to that passage or that sermon. This is Moses asking to see the glory of God. And Moses is picked up essentially by God, put in this little rock, a cleft of the rock, and God places his hand over it. And God goes by. And as God goes by, the glory of God is declared. The character of God is preached. Verse 6, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Did the children of Israel deserve the steadfast love of God? Absolutely not. They had complained against God. They had insulted God's guy. They had insulted God. Now they're saying, God, you want to kill our kids, don't you? And God's like, Ten plagues. Red Sea. Water out of a rock. Like, what else do you need? And that's me pretending to be God. God is not like that. He is steadfast and merciful and gracious, right? I mean, there it is. I can't even impersonate God. I'm such a fallen person, right? He's abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping the steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression of sins, but by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers of children on the children's children to third and fourth generation. Here's, here's the character of who God is. Yes, he is the righteous judge, but he's so much more than that, right? He's steadfast in love and abounding in mercy and grace and slow to anger. This is who God is, and now they're assaulting the character of God because they've fallen prey to fear. No longer are they anchored by what God has said. There are really in a overly simplistic way. There are two types of people. There are people who start sentences with I feel, and there are people who start, start sentences with I think. And typically God, in a sense of humor, has those people fall in love and get married, and it's a powder keg of craziness sometimes, right? So I'm a I think guy. My wife is an I feel guy. Uh, I, I feel girl. Let's strike that from the video, right? But we're, we're different people, and so we, we approach things differently. Same is true with the Lord. For many of you, during this very strange season that we're in as a church and community and country, You have often felt that God is not present with you. Trials and giants and waves and difficulties in your life feel something. Now, the I think people like to demean the I feel people, but we're we're just as jacked up in our own mind. Because often the I think people are very prideful. Like, I know God says that, but I think. And we create in our mind some supposedly sophisticated rebuttal to the truth of God. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter how we feel or how we think. And that's not to degrade people's feelings of loneliness or sorrow. That's not what I'm saying. But the anchor to the reality, the anchor through storms, the anchor through trials, the the motivation, the strength to step into the unknown of, of this world 
is not what we think or what we feel. It's okay, I'm done with that one. It's what God says. It's what he says. And I, I find myself in those moments. If I can be very transparent with you, um, I don't know what to think about COVID-19. I'm just some dumb hick pastor, right? Like, I don't, I'm not a medical professional. I mean, I've washed my hands 8 million times over the last couple months. I wear a mask. I'm fat, so I feel like I'm suffocating to death, right? Like, I don't know. Sorry, I'm just being honest. I don't know. I don't, don't want to get sick, right? I don't, I don't want my wife to get sick. I don't, I don't want my kids to get sick. Like, I don't know. Sometimes you, you work yourself into the chaos and fear. And, and I think people like myself, we don't like to say that we're afraid. So we use synonyms, but we never use the word afraid. When you just cut to the chase, we're afraid. And you go work yourself up into so much confusion and anxiety. And then what does that lead to? Complaining, doubting the character of God, removing voices out of our life that speak truth to us, going back to Egypt, going back to idols and habits of our past, self-reliance, when we are meant to live fearless lives completely dependent on the presence of the Lord Jesus. That's why the Bible says, I've not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. I don't know what your circumstance is, My heart always is burdened for Christian kids. I know it's weird because I was, I was one of them. And man, I felt prey, fell prey to a lot of deceitfulness of sin. One of the verses I have to go to often is Psalm 1611. You're a Christian kid in here. You grew up in a Christian home. This is my gift to you. Psalm 1611 Speaking of God, this is David. David says to God, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. God is not calling you to be a boring, lifeless, joyless person. And that's often what the church portrays. And then Satan dangles in front of you what looks like it's going to be joy and fulfillment and pleasure. And it is for a moment, but it's hollow and deceptive and disease. When we come and we follow the path of life that the Lord has laid out before us, there is fullness of joy. There is pleasures forevermore at his right hand. I have to come to that verse. For some of you, it might be book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything. I'm going to read that again. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer, and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. Notice that it is not grumbling. Notice it is not assaulting the character of God. Noticing it is not questioning the faithfulness of God. It is bringing our requests to God with a thankful heart and the peace of God, verse 7, which surpasses all understanding, will guard 
And I love this passage because Paul, who's writing here, is in Rome and he has a Roman guard shackled to him 24-7, 365. Do you know what the peace of God is likened to here by Paul? A guard that never sleeps, that is always there. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts. And I like to say, I feel and your minds, I think, in Christ Jesus. Joshua, the leader who would take over from Moses, was nervous, and I think rightfully so, and God said, just like I was with Moses, I will be with you, I'll never leave you, and I will never forsake you. Man, when you feel alone, if you belong to Christ, you are never alone. You're never alone. You know, the promises of God, God says, I will provide all of your needs. God will provide your needs. And sometimes we wonder, man, what does the future look like for my, my job or my company or my industry or my life? What does the future look like? And the Father of glory, the, your heavenly Father speaks and he says, I've adopted you. You're in my family. You're my child. You belong to me. You're a co-heir with Christ and I will provide your needs. And maybe for you, you don't think that or feel that but what needs to anchor our hearts and minds is the truth of what God said because here's the result. Emotional chaos. If I can, I, I just, I want to give you just a practical tip here. Caleb and Joshua we're speaking, let's go. Moses and Aaron, let, we're, let's go. Let's go do this. And the people listened to 10 voices rather than the, voice, the voices who were speaking truth, the voice of God. Who are the voices you listen to? Some of you... You just need to turn off the TV. And, and, and get off social media. And take all that time and say, what does God say? And believe that so that when those trials come or that confusion come or that, that comes or that difficulty comes or that, that, that unknown is facing you, it's like this is what God says. And I, I don't have to be an emotional basket case. If you find yourself complaining, do you know what's at the root of complaining? What's at the root of complaining is a unbelief of the truth of what God has said. That's why the Bible says in Hebrews 11, without faith it's impossible to please God. Meaning what God says is true, is always true. And when I feel something different, I have to go back to what God has said. When I think something differently, I have to go back to what God has said. And God's truth is what anchors us. I want to give you the most important promise that God says. Romans 10.9 says, if you will confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. You'll be saved. You'll be saved. I remember as a young boy, maybe you'll remember these, these terrible Christian movies from the 70s. Uh, one was called Thief in the Night or something like that. How many have seen that before? I remember watching it in fifth grade and couldn't let my parents leave my sight because if they did, I thought the rapture happened on many occasions. It wigged me out, man. And it started years, sadly, started years of wondering, am I truly saved? 
Some of you may be sitting here right now and experiencing that. Am I truly forgiven? If I were to die in this moment, am I in heaven or am I in hell? Where, where am I in eternity? And the confidence of salvation is not a cognitive thing. And the confidence in salvation isn't the I feel thing. The confidence of salvation is in the anchor of God's promises. It's in God's promises. And so if you're here and you recognize that you're a sinner and you come to God through Christ and you say, I turn from my sin, that's a gift from God anyways, we turn from our sin and we turn to Christ and we confess him as Lord. We believe in our heart God raised from the dead. God says you are saved. And sometimes we just have to go back to those important passages and we have to say, you know what, I don't feel saved today. Sometimes I don't think it. Sometimes I'm such a wreck. Sometimes I'm such an emotional, crazy, unfaithful person. Man, when I am unfaithful, God remains faithful. And if he says you're saved, you're saved. If he says you're safe, you're safe. If he says you belong to him, you belong to him. And Romans chapter 3 says it this way, let God be true and everyone else a liar. And sometimes our emotions and our thoughts are liars and they sow those seeds of distrust and disbelief in God. I pray this week you'll open God's word. Say, God, what have you said? It's always true.